I never actually watched The Bachelor. And that's not a thing I say with pride or some sense of superiority. I honestly just don't watch a lot of TV. And I haven't since I was maybe like 12. When shows like The A-Team or Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom took up space on the 20 some odd networks available. So when I connected with Ben Higgins on Twitter, I didn't exactly know why my online friends freaked out a bit. See, while I came to find out that Ben was a celebrity in like the most celebrity of ways, having done reality TV as The Bachelor, I found in him a man who wasn't resting on the random success of such things. I found in him someone who was looking at where he was, at the influence he'd been handed, and asking the question, what do I do now? What can I make of this? I really loved talking with Ben, and I think you'll enjoy the conversation. Check it out. Um, so where are you? Where am I talking to you from? You're in your living room. Where are you? In Geographic. Indiana right now. This is my hometown. I'm at my, my parents' house. Came back with my fiance for the fourth. Come back every year for this. And then I live oh. in Denver, Colorado. You're from Indiana, from Indiana. Yep. And what took you to Denver? Uh, the only place that offered me a job out of college. Oh, really? nine years ago. Are you serious? Yeah. yeah. Were you trying to do something you couldn't do? And they, they like, was there like a specific job you chased? No, uh, it's, it's hilarious because I was working at a youth center in Warsaw, Indiana. My boss at the time goes, Ben, you're never going to leave here, are you? And I was like, I don't think so. I kind of like it. And she goes, well, here's the deal. My brother is the vice president of this company in Denver. Um, I think you should give it a shot to move out of Indiana. And I said, well, if he offers me a job, I'll consider it. And so we did. And I huh. took it and I just moved to Denver. Um, yeah, and so there wasn't really a job I was chasing as much as it was just me going, yeah, why I should shake it up a bit. I need to it yeah. also comes out of this. This is kind of funny. Um, my college girlfriend broke up with me. She doesn't we're friends today. She doesn't admit to saying this. I know she said it. And if she didn't, <laughs> then somebody did. But she goes, I'm an only child. And she when she broke up with me, she goes, Ben, I just I'm afraid you're never gonna leave home. Like you're never gonna want oh, adventure. Wow. And I remember mm. that stinging deep because as an only child, I always was trying to prove, no, yeah. that I wasn't, I was going to leave home. I was yes. going to try adventure. I wasn't going to be dependent. And so she said it. And then I was like, all right, this is, I'm out. I'm <laughs> Here we go. I'm going to go do it. <laughs> nothing quite like, nothing quite like the, the breakup or like the sting of the breakup to motivate you to, to do a thing. Uh, do, when you're home in Indianapolis or, or outside of Indianapolis, when you're home in Indiana versus yeah. being home in Denver, do you, is there, a, for you, is there like an emotional difference? Is there one place like this is home and this is kind of home? Or is, is it like, talk about the word home for you. Like, where do you feel like you are like most actually situated as, as, as you? Like, where is home for you? Yeah. It's, that's, that's a really interesting question for me because Indiana has, a huge place in my life for multiple reasons. One, uh, I, I come from a small town. It's actually called Winona Lake, Indiana. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it's about, oh, I would say it's probably growing at this point, but maybe at most 6,000 people in the town. Oh, wow. Uh, growing up here, you know everybody, or at least you know of everybody. I can walk the trails by my parents' house, and I guarantee you right now, if I got up, I walked out the door, and I took you with me, uh, there would be 15 people on that trail that would be walking today that I would say hi to and that I would know personally and that I would know where they live and what they do for a living. Huh. Um, I didn't recognize how special that was until I moved from here. And so there's yeah. a part of that uh, that still feels very comfortable, that still feels very much like it's giving me a big hug, this town is, and saying welcome back. It It still feels like home. And in fact, I'm back here now because... I'm in a transition season of life with a lot of things. Yeah. And uh, I'm getting ready to get married. Super pumped for that. That's a good thing in my life. She is a, a gift from God. Yes. Um, but I'm, I'm getting ready to transition a lot of ways. And I knew there was something inside of me said, you need to go back to the lake. You need to go mm. back to walk. You need to go back and take some time. Like you need to rest. And in yeah. Denver, um, it's starting to feel more, more like home, and here's why. A little my story is, you know, yeah. I was on a show. I got engaged on this show. Uh, we were living in Denver, Colorado, in this house, um, and we ended up. The relationship ended, and it never. And then here's another important moment. 
about three months after that, I was in Honduras on a trip and I get a phone call from the police that said that my front door has been kicked in and my house Whoa. has been ransacked. Huh. Uh, compl- like everything's gone. And wow. uh, I never, like, I was trying to make it home and that like shook me to my core, still does this day. And so I just got a new house and uh, starting a different life. And now it's starting to feel more like home there in the sense of uh, shelter. And it's also starting to feel like more like home because after eight years, you start to meet people again. Like I can yes. maybe see somebody downtown that I know. And that's important to me. Yeah. There's a there's an odd parallel here between growing up in the small town and knowing everyone and being known by everyone versus like a decade or so plus down the line functioning. And I'm going to use a word here that we're going to talk about more in depth because I don't, I don't know exactly what I mean by it. And I want to hear you talk about it versus like being what folks would identify as a celebrity and like, re- and being recognized where like there, there's something to this odd parallel between like, there's a small town, you know, of everyone and people know you. And then being in, in, in maybe industry towns and being known and knowing a bunch of people. Can you talk a little bit about like the difference between, how should I say this? It's one thing, right, to be known by people in a small town. It's a different thing to be known as the guy from the TV show. Mm-hmm. Um, ha, like, do you, is, 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 it's not even is one, of the, uh, is one of those preferable, but like, can you talk about the difference between like being small town Ben and being like Ben from the TV show? Do you experience, do you feel that as a big difference or is it, or are you more the kind of person who's like, Hey, people are people. Like, how does that work for you? I, I think it's a, I think it's a balance. And so here's a good example. Um, let's flash backwards a little bit. Uh, yeah. growing up here in Indiana, um, it's not uncommon for people to know people here. Like it doesn't stand out that people now may might know my name. I, I don't know if they would have or cared as much without the show. That's something that haunts me a little bit. Like when I do go to the coffee shop downtown and people are like, Ben, and they're so nice to me. They're asking me about my life and about my fiance. There's always a piece of me that's like, "Uh, I don't remember this seven years ago. Like I don't remember this being the response. Yes. I don't hate it, but I don't remember that. And so like, I, yes, things have changed there. Yeah. In a lot of ways for the better. Like I do feel like now, Personally, uh, people take more of an interest in my life, which mm. I don't see as bad. I wonder, though, what that would look like without the show often. So, like, mm. how much of their interest in me is because I was on a show Yeah. Um, that really I didn't do anything to be on that show? Like, I don't have any pride. I'm not mad I did it, but, like, I don't have any tangible skill sets that brought me that. I took no hard work to get to that show. Yeah. Um, they just asked me. Like, yeah. I just showed up. And, yeah. uh, and so that's... That is a, 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 an odd piece, but here's the beauty of this. Um, and so I had uh, uh, two instances in my life that have that have stuck with me when it comes to celebrity and fame. One is uh, when I when I signed up for the, when I was on the show and I was leaving. Uh, one of my buddies looked at me and says, "We'll see you in a couple weeks." Um, like one of my best friends, meaning like I wasn't going to last very long. He goes, "There's some studs on that show," and like you're fine, but like. It, you got like you're not going to be there. Long. I was like, Thanks for the pat on the back, homie. Appreciate yeah, that. Yeah. And so one that humbled me to ask myself the question: Am I really not that great? Uh, hmm. Two is my former boss, who was a great man, um, did an interview with Good Morning America. So Good Morning America came to town when we were filming the show here, and he was he's the head of the youth center here in town. I'd worked for him for years. And the headline of the in- article, and I still remember this today because I give him so much for it, says, in this town, Ben Higgins is still a nobody, um, which is like, <laughs> which is such a weird deal having it come from your hometown when the world at that point felt like it was telling me I'm a somebody. Yes. Um, that I'm that I'm different, that I'm special. You know, you're on the cover of magazine when you walk into the grocery store. You're on national television. And yeah. then somebody in your hometown goes, and this time still nobody. But there's a beauty to that statement that he made. Yeah. Because what he was saying was, in this town, if he, if he probably would have phrased it a little better, in this town, Ben Higgins is no better and no different than anybody else that's walking the streets here. He's one of us. In this, in, in this town, Ben Higgins is one of us. In this yeah. town, Ben Higgins is accepted. In this town, we don't care what he's done. 
or where he's going, when he comes back here, he's still a part of us. Yeah, that's good. And 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 that took some time, but after yeah. a while, it actually was unbelievably peaceful to me to hear yeah. that and let that ring true. So there's a side of me now, six years removed, that when I come back here and when yeah. somebody at the coffee shop doesn't ask me all the questions that I know they know from Instagram or from the media, yeah, there's a piece of that that's that's exciting for me because it makes me feel loved for something far beyond yeah. a show. Yeah, um, that's powerful. Yeah, so that, that's how I'd explain that. I think that's good. I've had the opportunity in my life, man, to be surrounded by a lot of people that like the humble. Again, going back to, you know, you and I talked a few minutes ago about the theme of this book I just wrote, you know, called It Is What You Make Of It. There is something to be said, though, like once once you have uh, once you once you have that platform, either because of like you're LeBron James and you're literally the best basketball player in the world. And that's how you get to this place where everyone knows you or it's a TV show and there's a little bit of a luck of the draw thing. Either way, you end up in this place and the question still ends up being to some degree the same like the the across the board with regards to celebrity or being known the question still ends up being the same like what do you what do you do with the power you've been given and a couple of things that i, I want to get into one is uh, i want to talk briefly about um i want to talk about generous uh international llc and your decision to to move in that direction i want to talk about the dream and we'll get to that in a second um i also want to talk about like your decision to be really public about your practice of faith. And um, that can be tricky. It can like that can be uh, that can be misread, that can be misconstrued. Um, can you talk a little bit about like, like as time has gone on, you've never wa- you've never wavered in terms of talking about like you're, you're a person of faith, you're a person who follows Jesus. Um, has that overall been a positive experience for you? Has it been a matter of like uh, you've been received well? Has it changed the way you've seen yourself as a person of faith? Talk about being a person of faith, uh, like, you know, in, in the public eye. What's that look like for you? It's been interesting. Um, you got to imagine I was 25 years old when the show started, yeah. coming out of college, and uh, you get thrown in this environment that's all like, it's very different. Uh, none of it's familiar. And I remember a lot of times my worldview was being shaken um, mm. and worldview. In a, and I mean that in a healthy way, like uh, my, my preconceived notions on faith and of people of other faiths and of people of different stories and yeah. different races and even different like orientations um, was being rocked because I fell in love with these people. Like I was, I, I, I heard their stories and I, I liked them. Like, yeah. And, and they weren't of the evil one. They, yeah. they, they didn't come off to me as destructive. Yeah. And I, I started the first time in my life. I mean, for as great as the town that we've been talking about is, it at one point was the Methodist capital of the world. Uh, it is now where the Grace Brethren Church, I don't, it's a pretty small denomination, but there's a denominational headquarters here. It's a very conservative town. Yeah. Uh, and is and, and for the best of attempts in this town, so diversity is not something that they can pride themselves on in right. any at any level. It's not necessarily because it's been pushed out. It's just because the Midwest hasn't exactly had the the place that people have stopped through. Like there's not a lot. to. I, I don't think a lot of people <laughs> want to stop and live here. Like, there's, you know, if you're not from here, you don't really want to live here. Um, but so, so I say this to say, like, my world was being rocked. Yeah. And I was changing. And the only thing I can lean back on is, God, where are you at in this? And mm. then I found myself crying out with this prayer was, God, if you're real and you're there, please show up in my life. Yeah, man. Like, because everything around me is being broken down. Mm. My preconceived notions, uh, some of the fundamentals of faith that I believe were everlasting that I had been told uh, would not change. Like, people were questioning that. There's a producer on the show um and he's brilliant and at the time of my my season he was reading the bible uh front to back and uh he's very agnostic and he knows why he's agnostic in his faith and he's very good at communicating why he's agnostic in his faith wow, and i'm great. 25 years old uh undereducated n- not at all a seminary student just a good old midwestern kid showing up and he's like 
asking me all these questions that are making my heart turn, hmm. my, my insides turn over, wow. uh, making me anxious and nervous. And I still was just crying out to God, God, you're, it feels like everything that I've known is ripped, getting ripped away. God, if you're there, please show up. God, if you're around, please like be here with me now. Yeah. And you know, G- Jesus showed up in a way that I'll, I'll never forget. And that I can't not speak of yeah. because what happened was Jesus showed me, uh, peace. He showed me understanding. He showed me love. He showed me gentleness. He showed me patience. He showed me these things that I always knew of Jesus, yet they weren't at the forefront of my mind when I thought yeah. about Jesus. And then I thought about, and then something else very simple came to my mind. Uh, and I don't know why at this moment, but it came to mind that God has called me because when all the complexities and all the noise was being thrown at me and all these questions are being thrown at me and I didn't have an answer for any of them, something rang true in my heart that said, Ben, all I've asked you to do is love God and love people. Like that's all like at the it's end of the day, that everything else. Yeah. will fall into place. Yeah. And I took that and I said, okay, from here on out until, until maybe I can get some more context to why I believe one. if I can love God and love people, everything else makes sense. That's like it. all of a sudden this, this, beautiful truth of Jesus. The whole world makes sense. The way people interact makes sense. My curiosity for stories makes sense. Uh, my passion for fighting injustice starts making sense. Yeah. Like all of this stuff starts making sense. And so at that point forward, I said, maybe just maybe the message of Jesus needs to be shared that way. Maybe that's what God's calling me to, because if I've now seen, and I can't say that God is not truth, if I've tried to pursue truth and Jesus showed up. So if Jesus yeah. is true, then now what and how do I communicate this truth yeah. to those around me in a way that insp- that inspires, that shows love and kindness and not in a way that isolates and hurts and destructs. And so that's been an exciting journey. I'd say it's been hard at times. The church isn't the most forgiving uh, in general when it comes to the, the show and to, to like how I've gotten to where I've got. It's getting a little rough. Yeah. Um, and, and especially when you're young and think about this, like your faith is already kind of breaking down a little bit. Yep. And then all of a sudden you get off a show and the church like kind of like jumps on top. Yeah. Like that, that, get, that got hard. That's a little, um, but to, to close out this statement, the reason why I've stood and spoken about Jesus uh, is because I am in love with a God uh, who has called me to love others. And when I love others, a lot of this life starts becoming special and exciting yeah. and sacred. Yeah, I mean, even the way you started off by saying, like you, you, you know, your your faith and your worldview, the way you had understood the wor- world as, as a person of faith, was being shaken because you were surrounded by people that, culturally at least, you'd been told different stories about, like these that like this this group of people, this orientation, this political orientation, this sexual orientation, this religious orientation. Th- these people are like either what well, you, know, you wouldn't have said enemies, but like they're of the evil one or whatever. And you, and the thing you said that was super key was, but I was actually falling in love with these people. That's actually the thing that changes everything. And that are, it, it, it's a far more enjoyable. And I would say far more Jesus shaped life. If the thing, if the filter through which I'm engaging with my world is that I've simply chosen to love people. I'm not going to try to, I'm not going to try to pigeonhole you. I don't want to try to figure you out. I don't want to try to avoid you. I just want to learn to love people, period. That simplicity, I mean, it's like, it sounds so kid-like, but like, there's also, <laughs> there's also a little bit of an instruction. It's like, Jesus said to his dudes, he was like, I wish you were more like kids. I wish you yeah. let things be more simple. Just love people. I love the, I love the way you come, the, and the other part of the, the you know, the, the, the Christian instruction of love and Jesus talking about love is when he, when he talks about how to love people. He says, <clears throat> again, this very simple and very difficult thing. He says to love your neighbor as yourself. You um, you did an interview on page six uh, recently. It was just published about uh, like folks will call it self-care. Folks will call it all kinds of things. The, the, you ran up against some stuff in you. That you're like, I need to go. I need to go take care of myself, uh, which in and of itself is a, like a powerful decision to be like, I, I tell, I tell my clients all the time. It's in the middle of the book. Like you are the, you are the gift you're giving. Uh, it's not about the artifacts. It's not about the show. It's not about the LLC. You are the gift you're giving. And you are like, there you are taking that seriously. Like if I'm not healthy, I can't do good work. But not only do you do that, you actually chose to be public about this part of, of your process, which is really, which is a really interesting and, and risky 
in some ways, decision to make to say here, here, I'm peeling back a layer. This is what it looks like for me to be me in this moment. Can you talk about this, the decision to like, to be public about like, I, I, I'm on a journey. I'm taking a moment to take care of myself. I'm not ditching the game I'm in, but I need him. I need a minute to go get healthy and get centered and like, talk about the decision to like, be, to be public about that. Was that, was it conscious? Like how, how did that come about? Yeah. So, um, it kind of started spur on slowly, but surely, uh, there was, uh, more time that I desired to stay in bed. There was less energy, um, that I had to do tasks that historically have been really exciting for me. Mm -hmm. Um, my mind was spiraling and wandering, uh, with anxiousness and panic at times, uh, fairly consistently. And in those, and I'm not unfamiliar with those feelings. They've happened a few times in my life. And typically, uh, I I haven't confronted them. I kind of let them just dig deep until like I'm breaking and then it comes out in a a negative way. My reaction becomes really terrible. Hmm. Well, I, because it's happened and I'm not familiar with it, I recognized fairly early on that I needed help. I needed to figure, like I needed to confront this. I needed to, to lean into it. I've called it, um, and sit in it and figure out what is the, what this, these are symptoms of something that I'm experiencing internally and I need yes. to process. Now you talk about it often. Um, but one of the reasons why I decided to make it public is, you know, I came out with a book in February called Alone in Plain Sight. And the mm-hmm. hope with that book was to help people feel less alone. Yes. The, 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 if, if I've said, if, if somebody reads that and the, all they get at it, out of it is that they're not alone. Yes. It's all been worth it. Like the, totally. the, every page is worth it. Yes. Um, and I, I shared that because I had to, like, I had to share that message because yeah. I know what it feels like to feel alone. And I know what it feels like to feel like you're spiraling. Well, now I, I have the ability to, um, to speak publicly. Uh, yeah. And I'm still fairly unfamiliar. It's only been a few years, but I'm still unfamiliar with how it looks. But when I choose, when I'm in these situations and I know no matter how hard it is that like, I'm not the only one in it. Yeah. that other people are experiencing because the more I've talked about my pains and my sorrows, the more relatable and the more vulnerable other people become to me. Yep. Um, that if I'm going to create anything good out of this moment, outside of healing myself, it's allowing others in yes. and allowing others to hear that yep. they're not alone in that. And so for me, it is a conscious choice, but it's a very clear choice. One selfishly, the selfish part of that is I need community during this time. Also, I need mm. others to tell me, that that we're there in it too yep. uh that we're in it together that i'm not alone i need yep. that part the second piece is i believe others can maybe just possibly benefit if they come across an article if they maybe pick up the book or they see it on instagram whatever they do if one person just sees it and says hey uh been struggling with xyz so am i uh maybe yep. i can make it one more day maybe yes. i can take one more breath maybe I can, maybe i can get up and walk again or maybe i can take time maybe they hear and they can take time to heal and recover and get help because it's just no longer taboo and it's no longer unspoken. Now it's out there. Yes. Uh, so there's a selfish side of that. And then there is a, what I, th- I think a side that like, I just believe now it's, it's, it's a responsibility. I have. Yeah. And, and there, you know, we come back to a few, a few things come together from Mary here. One is like, it, it is one thing to, to write the book alone in plain sight and talk about, Hey, you guys aren't alone. No matter what you're going through, it's another thing entirely to actually publicly embody that and be like, look, cause this is, I mean, like, like whether it's depression or anxiety or it's addiction or like all of these things are the things that actually end up isolating us. And, and like when we hit those like dark spots, the thing that we are told in our, in our sick little psyches is that no one wants to deal with this with you. This is the worst part of you. Don't show it. And, and we end up isolated. So with, for you to have written the book alone in plain sight, and then given the opportunity to you know, the choice to like not be public about your own struggles, but like look like the, you know, on the top of the mountain authority figure or look like the human being who wrote the book because they needed it too. You made that choice, which I think galvanizes you as someone who gets to tell that story. Like you get to say, hey, you are not alone no matter what you're going through here's what it's looked like for me. That's super powerful, which then comes back to like, why I'm so compelled by the person of Jesus is because it's one thing to have ideas about love. It's one thing to have ideas about faith and about generosity and about justice. It's all, all these things are the wonderful as ideas. 
they're powerful when they're embodied. They're powerful and life changing when like someone actually does it. It's the thing about Jesus over and over for me. It's like, that's what it looks like in the body, in a person to love well and to forgive. Forgiveness as an idea, it's beautiful. Forgiveness as an actual practice is devastatingly difficult. And you get to watch Jesus actually walk that stuff through or whether it's justice or charity, what's it look like to give beyond <laughs> your apparent means? And you see that in the person of Jesus. So for that, that moment for me, watching, watching you make the decision to, to be public about like a, about this particular season and say like, yeah, I'm going to go, I'm going to go back to where I'm from. I'm going to go, I'm going to go take care of myself. Um, because this is what it looks like for me to like be in this, what otherwise could have been a really isolating spot and share this with the world. Um, with, with the LLC, um, the decision you made to, to, to start generous, um, this was like, was this a seed in you, a dream in you that you had had for a long time? Like, how did it, how did, how did the thing pop up for you that you were like, this is the thing I, I want to start an LLC. I want to, I, I, this kind of like the redemptively oriented business model thing. Like, how did this pop up in your mind? What did that look like? So when I was, uh, when I was in middle school, my family went on a trip to Central America and, uh, we entered into communities that, uh, lack clean water, education, food, healthcare. I mean, they're in the middle of nowhere. And we went this organization and they were doing good work. It was a disaster relief organization. It was, it was answering the call to Hurricane Mitch. Um, mm -hmm. And so they're, they're passing out um, like food boxes uh, to these people. And then we were, you know, do a little church service and we'd leave. Well, we went back the next year and people were still hungry, still thirsty, still lacking clean, like still lacking education, healthcare, all these things. Yeah. And my buddies and I had gone back with me and they said, is there anything more we can do? Like yes. this, this, this doesn't feel right. Like great that they're there. You know, I have nothing against organization, but great that we were there, but is there anything more we can do? How can we help in a way that doesn't hurt and how, and it, and it feels odd to, uh, it felt odd to us then that people were lining up to our bus to beg for food boxes that would last maybe a month. And then we were leaving and coming back a couple months later. Um, so from that, my buddy was smart enough to start an organization called Humanity and Hope United. And Humanity and Hope United, in short, does this. They enter into communities and they ask the people there, what do you need, what do you want, what do you dream of, and how can I help? Wow. Uh, and then we uh, allow the community to lead us in the strategy, yes. in the decision-making. We're just behind them the whole way in a support role, uh, be that financially, be that with resources, et cetera. It's going tremendously, and it hmm. grew in incredible ways from my time on the show because I we were advocating for it, for it pretty heavily. Well, yeah. Uh, after the show hit, uh, and, and this story does get, get shorter now, after the show hit, uh, okay. I was feeling pretty alone based on the fame and the celebrity. I yeah. loved it for a while, and then all of a sudden it hit me in the face, and I felt <laughs> like I'm running this race, and then I don't really know what to show for it. Like Other than chasing wow. relevancy, this feels pretty isolating. This feels yeah. pretty purposeless. Yeah. So I called one of my wisest buddies at the time. Still one of my friends. He's still wise. But I called him, and I said uh, – this is where my this is where I'm at. I don't know what to do with it. Um, I have a team of people around me trying to keep me relevant, and I feel dead inside. Yeah. And he said, Ben, what if this whole thing was never meant to be about you? What if there's only one name meant to be famous? That's Jesus. What if no human is meant to be famous? Now, fame is not bad with, when it comes to opportunity, but it's how you use it. It's what you do with it. And what if yep. this whole thing is never meant to be about you? And it sounds really like churchy and really Christian. He's like, and, and then he turned it. He goes, what if there's something you could do with this that makes the world a better place? Mm -hmm. um, because he is a Christian uh, as well. And I thought he was going to turn it to be like, just go out and talk about Jesus, which is something I've heard my whole life. And it's never really <laughs> known what that means. Go become a preacher, it, it, get on a sidewalk, get a platform. Yeah. Bring a sign. Exactly. Yes. And he said, what if you can make the world a better, better place? So we start talking about H&H. &H. Um, after this conversation with my buddy, my other friend and I went down to Honduras and we took a road trip to just talk through this idea of what the next season of life looked like for me. I was in a similar place that I am right now. Hmm. Uh, and one of the things we came up with was that we believed we could find a way to sustainably support nonprofits around the world by selling high quality products that told a story behind them as well. Wow. So we yep. chose coffee because coffee is universally consumed, not consumed by everybody, but a lot of people. 
people sit and drink uh, coffee in mm -hmm. group settings. Um, and so we started a company called Generous International. Four people founded it and all the owners signed off the ability uh, to make any money on the value of the company. So if the company ever sells or on the sale of a product. Hmm. And so a hundred percent of the profits, it's a for profit company. We call ourselves for purpose um, just because it feels better. But yes. <laughs> we're, uh, we're a for purpose company that donates a hundred percent of our profits to nonprofits around the world. Uh, all through the ability to sell coffee to people's houses around America. Wow. Um, so it was, it came from, yes, it came from this thread of, Hey, I want to, I've seen injustice. I've seen poverty. How can I help it? I like business. Uh, let's figure out a business model that can work. And then the, the cool effect that we hope to have one day is that we hope this model kind of like somehow, some way, like soaks into the ethos of other larger companies so that they say we can be for purpose also i love that it's a it's a really cool work it's a really and it is really good, like a fascinating and and that one would even say i mean we talk we, we keep we come we, we you and i keep coming across this theme in a sense it's kind of it's it's simple it's like well why would there's sort of like why wouldn't you do that um yeah. and like setting and again as an idea really cool idea but as an embodied practice it becomes powerful someone looks and says oh they did that that's how that's done and to be able to model it after that is that's i i love that about uh, about the fact that you, you kicked it off that way um folks who want to figure out uh want to learn more about generous uh, where are they going they're going to generouscoffee.com thank you for asking that yeah generouscoffee.com uh, or the links in my Instagram at Higgins.Ben. You can kind of follow, find that as well. Yeah. Um, what what's next look like for you? Like, um, talk about the next like couple months to a year. Do you have Do you have a plan? Uh, do you have like it, the you're you're in a you're in a place of healing and restoration. Is this like there's a little bit of a reinventive phase here? Like, what's what what does next look like for you? Such a good question right now. Um, and I haven't been asked it, uh, since I came back. Uh, and if I answer it just kind of as honestly as I can, one is I'm getting married in November and I'm super yeah, man. about that. Um, like it's odd that my personal life feels as peaceful and as amazing as it's ever been. That's so Yet good. there's this undertone of like, uh, changing professionally. That's like a beautiful breaking down for a breakthrough. The next few months look like a desire and a prayer for a breakthrough. Um, hmm. uh, generous is at a place uh, where the the pandemic is, uh, as I mentioned, changed a lot of things. We had two coffee shops. When we donate one hundred percent of your profits and you open up a coffee shop and you lose one of them, um, <laughs> that gets <it> hurts. hard. <laughs> yeah, that, that hurts is hard. <laughs> um, and so I'm really hoping to see generous. Um, generous pivot to something beautiful, pivot to something sustainable, pivot to something um, magical that all of us can view as, as sacred and special and get excited yeah. about again. Right now, it's heavy on my heart because, yeah, it hurt. Um, yeah. The the next stage of life is, you know, is becoming a husband. And man, it's, it's been harder than I thought to be known and have my identity exist and being known as a bachelor for six years, man, and being <laughs> celebrated for being a bachelor and being single and getting attention for being a bachelor and being single and then finding this amazing woman and then yeah. getting married and being so si excited about it. But there is an internal switch that I want to make sure uh, that I am the best husband possible for her. Yes. And so a lot of this time is me developing skills and meditating, contemplating on like, how can I, like, what, what in my life now do I need to still strip away so that I can enter into that space um, in the best way possible, still knowing that I won't be perfect, but I can still do something. So that's, and it's a slowing down, man. It's been a fast race and it's a, it's a slowing down emotionally and mentally for me uh, to take more time to breathe and to, pray and to just be human again because for six years it feels like i was a machine yes and i was pushed side to side and so that's that's what the next couple months look like and it and so the to close this thought yeah um 
the next couple months also, what I know I need is to get excited mm. about the slowing down, to That's get good. excited about the slowing down. That's great. I love that. Well, I, I mean, we, again, the, the th one of the themes you and I have come back around to uh, over the last <laughs> few minutes talking is the it's one thing to have an idea. It's another thing to be the person. And I, you know, w insofar as uh, like your podcast is focused on, you know, uh, you know, hope, hope winning, <laughs> it wins in your life because you have, uh, you have given the opportunities you've been, you, you've been handed, you've chosen, you've made the decision to do with what you've been given, uh, not just good things, but at times like kind of surprising things. And, um, so not, not always like the predictable good thing, but the, the thing that's in you to do. And this is the long term, right? Of uh, the long term health of, of art or ministry or business is if it's not in my skin, then when the rubber meets the road and the sand gets pulled out by the tide, like I'll quit. But if it is in my skin, I just don't have the choice to quit. Like if that's in me, if what I'm doing with my life really is an outpouring of who I am and like for, for folks like you and I, of who I am in Christ, then it kind of doesn't matter what comes and hits me. Um, I'm going to get knocked down like everyone else. And maybe I need to take a minute and get healed up and like go to the doctor and get my bones patched back together. Okay, I'll do that. But when that, when I'm, but then after that, I'm going to get back at it. Because that's it's not just a thing I do; it's actually who I am. And what I've what I've enjoyed watching in you uh, since we met on Twitter is this is someone who isn't just doing good works, but is recognizing who they are in the works that they're doing, and like the expression in in work and communication is clearly also a kind of a self discovery and like and a self examination and it makes you it makes you worth not just paying attention to but following and rooting for and it's one of the reasons I'm on your team and I'm I'm and I'm happy to be so thank you for your time and for for making some space right now man happy to be here yeah happy to be here and thank you for listening to this episode of the at sea podcast if you'd like to follow up with the work that ben is doing in the world and be part of it jump to generouscoffee.com and not just follow along but pick up some of what they're doing i think their model is beautiful i think it's not only beautiful but it's effective and that's a rare thing to find in the world beautiful and effective work on behalf of other folks on the other hand or maybe at the same time if you'd like to be part of the team of folks who continue to make this podcast happen I'd love to have you on the team. Jump to patreon.com backslash Justin McRoberts and become a contributor. We're going to start a campaign in the fall to bolster what we're doing, to make this a little bit deeper, a little bit broader, and there will be some treats involved. I've got something planned I'd love for you to be a part of. I would love to see you there. Until next time.